Uh, hello, everybody, after lunch. Uh, some of you even heard about containers. Many people probably understand what they are. So let's give a, uh, let's give a hand to Matthias, who will explain how can we deal with them in Debian. Thank you. Um, yeah, my talk is called Software Bundling Sucks, and I hope we can have a discussion in the end on uh, yeah, why, uh, how we could implement it in a way, or how we could use it in a way that it sucks less. So first of all, um, to set apart especially containers from uh, the approach that is bundling, what is bundling actually? Uh, bundling is an approach to make software runnable without recompiling uh, on ad ideally multiple distributions by embedding all the dependencies uh, which are required to run that particular software. And that unfortunately includes low-level stuff like libc uh, as well as toolkits like GTK or um, Qt. Um, yeah, simply because you cannot know what stuff is present on the target distribution. Um, unlike containers, it usually doesn't involve to include a full distribution, and uh, it's also more tailored to a GUI and, and desktop uh, environments. So uh, the current focus of most of the bundling stuff is to run stuff on, uh, on Linux desktops and not to uh, run server things, which is what Docker is mostly about. <clears throat> so uh, how are applications currently distributed? Um, there are a few things uh, that make a Linux distribution not ideal for, um, for, uh, for distributing software. And that is mainly that uh, we ship uh, that a Linux distribution like Debian is an operating system and applications. So we have things which are clearly part of the operating system, like the Linux kernel, um, the libc uh, compilers, and even uh, things like toolkits. But we also have the applications like Krita, GIMP, uh, Shotwell, or whatever. Uh, so and those things follow different, uh, yeah, have different goals and different ideas on how uh, software distribution should work. They are on the one hand right now. Um, the, uh, wow, it's really slow, sorry. <laughs> there are the upstream developers right now who uh, create some awesome software, put it, um, yeah, um, make the software, the uh, source code available, give it to a distribution packager who gen then packages it for a distribution. Mm, and all these different entities in this yeah, delivery pipeline have different goals and uh, have different standards they apply to the software. Like the upstream project or the uh, project upstream who uh, develops an application wants people actually to use the latest and greatest release and also does not care that much about uh, backporting uh, stuff to a certain uh, upstream version. There are some upstreams which have long term releases, uh, so they can backport stuff for this, but this might not be the releases that end up in the distribution and end up being supported by uh, some yeah, a distribution like Debian. Um, also, they want to have people to uh, make. They want to have people quickly install their stuff in order to test uh, if a certain bug fix is uh, is working, or um, yeah, to uh, to test the new builds on on all distributions. And they do not want to create a dev package or an RPM package and test it on all the different Linux distributions that there are out there. Um, the distribution package, on the other hand. Uh, cares about system integration. So if there's an upstream software published, uh, the distribution packager uh, makes it match the policy requirements that the specific distribution has, and uh, also cares a lot about integrating it well into the system. So this is what we are all familiar with, I think. Um, and yeah, the distribution packager also backports stable fixes and maintains the software independently from the original upstream in the distribution. And the distribution itself uh, ideally should be rock solid and uh, yeah, users, users don't want accidental regressions. For example, their printer not working because there's something changed in the kernel. Um, some people use rolling releases, of course, which, doesn't, uh, which don't have this problem. But uh, yeah, rolling releases are uh, mostly something for more experienced users who know how to deal with potential breakage. So it's, it's not really a solution for, uh, especially not for uh, enterprise environments where uh, you really don't want this kind of flux where you cannot rely on, uh, on things being stable and not changing and have a, a target to develop for. Um, so yeah, and the distribution obvious doesn't, obviously doesn't change often. So you see there's a clear conflict between upstreams wanting to push things to the users faster and the distribution basically not allowing that by its current scheme. So why do people bundle things? Um, it's mainly because uh, they want, obviously, new software, which is not in the distribution repositories, um, 
get new releases out. And also, there are some, some smaller goals, like uh, testing a bug fix I've seen provided quickly, and uh, also some, some goal that uh, distributors themselves would have less work if they do not need to package the world. So uh, obviously, we cannot package every single application out there, which is published in source code. So if, uh, if upstream could make it available directly to the users, we do not need uh, to well waste time on uh, on creating software or on creating distribution packages for every thing, single application out there. So now, if you uh, look at this, you might ask, why do uh, upstream projects not use uh, Debian or uh, Red Hat package manager repositories for, to deliver this stuff? One of the biggest reasons is security. Because uh, if you install a dev package, uh, which is basically designed for, um, for yeah, deploying an operating system, you run stuff as root at install time, which is something you really do not want if you get something from a, a less trusted source. Uh, it might not be that there is, uh, is a virus in there or some malicious software, but that the person who created that package simply didn't know how to create, how to write proper scripts, and therefore has something in there which might break your system sooner or later. Um, also, these additional packages break distribution upgrades quite often. So if, the, if there's some local package installed which uh, the distributor, so we do not know about, it might uh, lead to collisions when you try a dist upgrade. And this is something no user wants, and especially not the distributor uh, wants. Uh, another thing is that, uh, of course, DEP and RPM repos are distribution specific. We see right now that there is a lot of stuff packaged for Ubuntu, and a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of uh, software vendors advertise we support Ubuntu and Ubuntu only. And uh, yeah, this is an issue if you run a different Linux distribution. Uh, it's even uh, not possible sometimes to uh, use Ubuntu packages on Debian, and it's even more annoying for uh, users of Arch or Fedora. So. Um, yeah, uh, if you have something with uh, which just runs on every Linux distribution, you can um, you can uh, yeah well <laughs> avoid these problems of Ubuntu centrism. Also, uh, as a software vendor, um, you can target a really huge market of all Linux distributions. While uh, when you are um, when you are just producing a dev package for Debian, you are targeting the Debian user group or the Debian users, which is a much smaller percentage of all the Linux users. So especially for commercial uh, vendors, if they have stuff which you can, they can say, OK, we support it on all Linux distributions, it's much nicer if they have a larger market which they can publish their stuff on. Um, additionally, dev and RPM repos are quite an overkill if you just want to deliver an app because uh, the Debian package format and also RPM was designed for uh, yeah, creating a distribution and creating an operating system and not specifically tailored to distributing just applications. So they are a bit more complicated than they would need to be. Uh, obviously, one could adjust the tools in order to make this easier, but uh, you would still have the security issue and the distribution specificity. So uh, it's actually, in my opinion, not worth it. So. Um, these are the problems with the traditional way of uh, creating packages to, uh, to um, deliver software. But obviously, there are also a lot of problems with the bundling approach. Ironically, security is one of them. Uh, upstreams now would uh, need to uh, ensure that they are not only fixing bugs in their software and updating their software, but also updating all bundled components. So in case something has bundled um, OpenSSL and there's a security update, this particular upstream needs to be aware of that and update OpenSSL, which is currently handled by the distributors. And uh, upstream basically doesn't need to care about stuff uh, breaking in uh, or being, uh, being bad in other components that, uh, that they use. So uh, this is something uh, upstreams would need to take responsibility for. Uh, and from experiment, experience, we all know that this, uh, well, often doesn't really work. Um, also, disk space is an issue because these extra copies of software, which you already have on your Linux distribution, uh, require a huge amount of disk space. So um, there's some kind of deduplication needed to uh, make this problem less prominent. Also, um, we as distributors do a lot of QA on software, which uh, dis, uh, upstreams do not do because they don't have the knowledge or do not do because they don't have the time or because they don't have the infrastructure to do it. So um, yeah, what, uh, this would, be, would still need to be done by, um, by the upstream projects. 
especially license checks, which we do in Debian uh, and uh, yeah, quite extensively and annoy upstream, uh, upstreams with. This is something which upstreams would need to care about a lot by themselves. Uh, for one example would be the uh, OpenSSL exception and GPL code. So far, nothing happened, but uh, it's a well, it's a legal issue which uh, upstreams would need to take care of. So, and another issue of bundling is the system integration, because um, if you have a different version of GTK bundled with your application, which uses different, uh, yeah, different theming APIs or a different way of theming things, then uh, you use a newer version of this in. Uh, in your, in your main operating system and the user changes the theme to something, well, less, support, less well supported, then you will have this one bundled application looking completely different and behaving completely different from anything else you have on your system. So uh, the integration is really a huge issue with, uh, with uh, bundling and with bundled applications. And yeah, there are some, some ways uh, to, to work around this, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a tricky bit. So, um, one thing to keep in mind about bundling is that uh, actually a bundling will um, pretty much always happen. So no matter what we as Debian do, or if we discourage it and say don't, don't bundle stuff, uh, bring it into Debian, uh, or whether we will just ignore it and say, yeah, well, um, bundling basically doesn't exist in our view on the distribution, um, upstreams will do it because the uh, advantages are much, uh, are so valuable for them that they, uh, yeah, will actually want stuff bundled. For example, there are many commercial software vendors like MATLAB who uh, create their own bundles and ship them because they want to target a larger Linux market and want to make installations a bit easier for, for their customers. So especially in the, in the field of uh, proprietary applications, this is very prominent. Mm. Like, but even for, for open source applications, a bundling has a lot of advantages and they are already embracing it. So ignoring it won't help. Uh, another thing is um, that ah, the presentation is really slow. Um, that the problems bundling solves are actually problems of the Linux ecosystem. So we, as an, a single distribution, cannot solve them on our own. Um, one problem with Linux is that you cannot really rely on anything being present on the system. You cannot rely on systemd APIs being there. You cannot even rely on Bash being the default shell or Bash being av available at all. Um, you cannot rely that, uh, that there is a certain version of libc or libstandard C++ available because you might have uh, used a newer compiler and uh, therefore, which isn't comp uh, compatible with the old version of the distributor ship. Uh, the only thing you can rely on that is that there is a Linux kernel, but even then you have the problem that there might not be all kernel features enabled. So uh, in order to really target, to really catch all distributions, you need to bundle, unfortunately, a lot of stuff to make it work. Um, and yeah, a single Linux distribution saying, okay, we standardize on these APIs and uh, keep the ABI stable for these libraries won't help because yeah, it's just one distribution and this is a problem of, well, the Linux ecosystem. Um, well, in the same, uh, yeah, it's also worth saying that uh, this flexibility and this way to change everything and every single bit of the stack is also one of Linux biggest strengths. So it's not something people actually want to solve because uh, the flexibility of Linux is uh, one, of, yeah, one of the reasons why it's so successful and you can use it in so many different areas and you can tailor distributions exactly to your needs. So uh, yeah, this is, this is actually an issue which cannot be that easily solved. So uh, how do the solutions actually look like? How do, do bundling solutions look like? Um, in the next slides, I want to go through a few of them. Uh, at time, yeah, at least six different bundling systems exist. This isn't actually true because this morning I learned uh, about at least one more. And this also doesn't include um, the container stuff. So if you add the container stuff, so Rocket and uh, Docker, it would be even more. And if you include things like uh, that um, other deployment methods use, like uh, Chef's omnibus packaging and things like that, it would be even more. So this problem has been solved uh, a lot of times in many different ways and in, yeah, in many different grades of uh, well, awesomeness or, or crappiness. So uh, one thing worth mentioning is that all the bundling systems which exist today are different from each other in the technology they use and the philosophy they, uh, they employ. 
some might say, okay, we do not want this particular thing to be possible at all, while others embrace it and say, yeah, we want, we want users to be able to do this. So there's not only a technology boundary, but also a, uh, yeah, a policy and philosophy boundary the bundling systems have. So let's start with the first, uh, the first bundling uh, system, which is App Image Kit, which is very popular right now. Uh, and I think it might actually be the one where most bundles exist, but uh, yeah, since it's hard to count and Snappy has, has also a lot of stuff in its store, it's, yeah, it's something you shouldn't, you shouldn't use to measure the popularity of, uh, of bundling systems. So, uh, for example, if you want to see an uh, if you want to see an actual live app image kit bundle, you can see uh, can check out Krita, who recently published one for them. So, what app image kit does it has is basically um, their bundles are ISO images, which have uh, yeah a small bit of uh, uh, an elf header in in their header. So, this thing uh, app image kit uh, bundles are actually uh, a normal ISO image and an executable which you download from some web page, uh, make it executable, and just run it. So uh, this will mount the, the image somewhere uh, and run the application inside. Those uh, App Image Kit bundles, uh, of course, have the virtue that you can offer users uh, some, uh, some executables to execute on Linux on their home page and yeah, make them easily run it in, yeah, without any installation step and without anything, uh, anything additional they need. Um, yeah, it also has, of course, the disadvantage that you can do that because uh, you might not want users to be able to execute that stuff uh, in their home directory, and it's also a bit harder to achieve system integration. Um, another thing is that it bundles all runtime data, so you might have a really huge uh, executable to download. So um, I'm waiting for. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, but AppImageKit it was is developed by an independent developer, and uh, it also doesn't really require any integration by the distribution. While all the other distribution, uh, all the other um, software um, bundling solutions need the distribution to make them available in some form in their distribution repositories, AppImageKit is pretty self-contained, and you can, uh, yeah, you can just download to any Linux distribution and do not require them to actually uh, package AppImageKit. Um, yeah, it doesn't have deduplication as of now, and uh, therefore the stuff is relatively huge. So moving on to Snappy, um, Snappy has a service running uh, called SnapD, uh, which handles these uh, these Snappy bundles, which are basically SquashFS images, also containing all the application data, data and the runtime data in one big uh, bundle. So they are uh, actually. They're actually more. Uh, they're actually bigger than App Image Kit bundles for for some applications. Um, yeah, but you have the SnapD service, which is managing them uh, transparently in the background and placing them in the right directories, registering them with the system, and uh, well, working for for system integration and also communicating with a Snap store. So you do not. Uh, you ideally do not download any Snappy bundle from the the vendor itself. But you go to a store where the software vendor has submitted the Snappy uh, bundle to and download it from there. So there's a certain level of, of trust involved uh, in this concept. Mm. Yeah, so uh, Snappy, as you might know, is primarily developed by Canonical and at time very Ubuntu centric. I'm saying this because. Um, the tools to create Snappy uh, bundles are not really available on, on multiple distributions, and yeah, building them on Ubuntu is uh, at time like the most supported solution, which isn't bad per se because obviously Canonical development for Ubuntu and on Ubuntu and uh, well cared about uh, making it work on Ubuntu first, and yeah, right now um, the uh, the Snappy bundling system is also coming to other distributions, including Debian. So people can uh, can have it as a really cross-distributional app store. Uh, as of now, it doesn't share runtimes, uh, but yeah, automatically garbage collects uh, the uh, the Snappy bundles if they are not used anymore. So um, you have you have really huge, huge and huge yeah you have really big bundles uh, to use. It also uh, has a sandboxing concept. So Snappy uses some kernel features like C groups uh, to. Um, to constrain the application, if possible, in, and in, uh, in order to uh, yeah to shield the host system from probably malicious applications, um, yeah. 
there's another um, another bundling system which has quite a lot, uh, uh, which has quite a strong sandboxing application, uh, sandboxing uh, implementation, and that is Flatpak, which was previously known as XDG app. Uh, Flatpak is uh, the first uh, bundling system in the series which splits actually splits runtime data from applications. So you have uh, your application in a separate well bundle and the runtime uh, in a separate bundle. So what software vendors do is um, when they develop their software, they, uh, they know what dependencies they have, and they pick a runtime which satisfies most of them. So if I develop a new GNOME media player, for example, and see, OK, it uses GTK, um, it uses maybe Vala, maybe something, something else, I, pick, uh, I will likely pick the runtime the GNOME project produces as an independent vendor built with their SDK, that, which is the corresponding development files, uh, which accompany a runtime, and then ship the result uh, as depending on the, this specific runtime uh, published by the GNOME project. Um, those, uh, those Flagpack runtimes are essentially um, basically operating systems without kernel. So they contain libc and, uh, and all the stuff you would expect uh, in order to need, uh, in order to build a software, and in order to run it, so <clears throat> um, they are created. Uh, well, um, in a similar way, uh, yeah, they are created by some uh, by the Yocto project or by tools created by the Yocto project, and are usually shipped by some different entity than the application. So the application vendor just picks one of the bundles from the GNOME or KDE project or any bigger uh, bigger entity which publishes uh, those runtimes and just uses it. One advantage of this concept is obviously that you can update the runtime as long as you do not change the ABI. So if there is a security issue in OpenSSL, and OpenSSL will highly likely be in the runtime, the application doesn't need to care about that because the vendor who created the runtime will take care of this and update, uh, and update that piece. So um, Flatpak was uh, initially designed by um, Alexander Larsen at Red Hat, and uh, yeah, it's also um, the, at the core of Flatpak is a technology called OS3, uh, which is really cool in its own and would actually deserve a, an, its own talk. Uh, but yeah, the, the main thing you need to know about this is that uh, it's, uh, it's very powerful for deduplication. So if some application ships the same file, and uh, if some, you might have three runtimes or more, if those runtimes ship the same files because they have the same G, uh, glibc version or whatever, uh, those get deduplicated, and you do not waste that much space. space. Uh, Flatpak also has a very advanced sandboxing concept, which also involves changing toolkits in order to, um, yeah, to, to request the, um, the desktop environment to open a file uh, for an application, then pass the, uh, the file descriptor of this newly opened file into the sandbox, and therefore allowing the application running in the sandbox to only open that file. This way, you can restrict um, the Flatpak application's access to your home directory, for example, and have it only open the files which you selected in the file selector running outside of the sandbox. So this is really cool. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, this is probably the most advanced uh, sandboxing concept for desktop applications which exists so far. <clears throat> then going on to Limba, which is my project. So. Um, but which I do not actively pursue uh, right now, but it's very interesting uh, concept-wise, uh, so I include it here. Uh, with Limba, you have the runtime split into different parts, um, and every software vendor, uh, and well, every vendor of any software publishes its stuff as a Limba bundle in this concept. So the OpenSSL guys would publish their own uh, Limba bundle containing just OpenSSL and an accompanying SDK containing the uh, the development headers, and the Qt project would um, build a bundle which contains uh, the Qt libraries. And then if you build your applications, you set dependencies on these particular uh, runtime components and say, OK, I want Qt and OpenSSL and, uh, well, something else I need to, to run my application. And then Limba would uh, ensure that these dependencies are satisfied and that stuff doesn't get upgraded to newer versions if it breaks ABI. Um, obviously, this requires that um, the independent software vendors uh, do not break ABI without telling them that they broke ABI, um, and also do not have behavior changes in it. 
So it's, it's overall a more, more, much more complex concept, but it ensures that uh, software gets updated to the maximum level uh, if it doesn't break API and makes it possible to split the load of maintaining that stuff because every upstream would maintain, uh, would maintain its own package. Mm, this obviously also doesn't work if you don't have a central service to act as some kind of, uh, yeah, uh, of protector of the system to tell you, okay, there are uh, currently five, five uh, applications depending on an ancient version of GTK. Uh, it might be useful to um, supply more security updates for this one or to simply drop these applications from the store and, uh, and tell them, yeah, and tell them to please update the GTK version because that one is unsupported. So you would need something uh, analyzing uh, which, which stuff depends on what in order, to, um, yeah, in order to make full use of this concept. So it's a, it's necessarily has to be a, a bit more centralized service to make it work. Um, an analogy would be, uh, for example, Python's pip service, uh, which has a very similar concept. So you can also think of it as a more meta distribution like. So um, yeah, this is what I said basically. You need the tools to check ABI and API. Um, because it's for, for, you, for the um, upstream project, it's a bit more difficult to create Limer bundles because they of course can stuff everything in one bundle. But uh, concept-wise, Limbo wants you to create these independent bundles and create a modular runtime out of them. So um, creating Limbo bundles is a bit harder, especially because the tools reject uh, to build a package on any, on any mistake you made. So creating the bundles and make them compliant to the policy set for Limbo is a bit more annoying. So this is one of the reasons why it didn't gain that much, much traction. And also the complexity of um, of the dependency stuff is quite quite huge. Uh, if you think of, of a lot of uh, projects uh, publishing it and of, for example, C++ compiler ABI changes, which might hit this concept. So uh, right now, I, th I still think it's a good project, but uh, I demoted it to a research project and want to figure out some of these, uh, some of these issues first and see if, what, if this concept can go somewhere. So, um, and maybe also make use of, uh, of flat pack bundles. So um, the thing to mention here is uh, you might not think why do we, don't we just create one bundling solution which fits all, all purposes and, uh, yeah, and works for everything, et cetera. Uh, the problem here is trade-offs. For example, there are a lot of design choices you want to make when creating a bundling system. For example, do you want, people to, uh, when do you want to allow people to install stuff into their home directory or should everything go into a systems directory? Or do you want to... Um, yeah, uh, do you want to have a split runtime or do you want to have a, a runtime which is, like, uh, which is bigger and provided by an, by an independent vendor? Or do you want to just allow uh, one runtime to exist and do not allow different runtimes to be available at all, et cetera? So um, because of these trade-offs, uh, right now there is really no way I can see that you can unify all of these different approaches, uh, therefore creating one solution to fix everything, uh, yeah won't really work. <laughs> so uh, what's our role as, um, as operating system developers and as Debian developers uh, when uh, with all this new bundling stuff being created and uh, overhyped on the internet? I think one, one of the most important things is that we should allow bundling to happen and do not blame people for, uh, for doing it. I saw that there are quite a lot of people saying, oh, yeah, it's so ugly that we bundle this stuff. We have it in the distribution already, so why don't we use it? Um, yeah, there are, there are a lot of issues um, with, with this that I outlined. So, uh, and people really want to solve an issue with this and want to scratch an itch uh, which they have. So uh, we should allow, allow bundling to happen and don't, don't really reject it that much. Mm, another thing uh, that we could do is to advise people on best practices to distribute software. For example, in Debian, we rebuilt everything with hardening flags, which upstream uh, projects might not know about. So. Um, yeah, we should maybe provide documentation on how to bundle properly. So how to employ the, uh, the quality standards we have as a distributor uh, and, make, and use them for, for the bundles uh, so upstream developers create. Mm. This goes, yeah. Additionally, one could make QA tools like something like Lintian, which checks for, uh, for our policy uh, on bundles as well. And long term, it would be 
would might, might be useful to offer a Debian bundles repository, which uh, reflects our values we have in the project, like being all free software and uh, being uh, matching a certain level of quality where we can say, okay, these are good bundles, uh, these are good, this is good software, and we trust the upstreams. You can install it on the system, and uh, yeah, basically it won't, uh, you won't run into trouble with that. Um, also, we should check that the operating system works well with sandbox applications, but this is more in the area of bug fixing. And also maybe create a trust path from uh, Debian uh, to trusted bundle repositories, which goes with the, um, with the fifth point on this list. So uh, this, is the, this is it, basically. Do you have any questions? Any question? OK. Hi, thanks. Do you know if the uh, Snappy project has any um, goals to do the sort of GDK and integration that Flatpak is doing, or is that is one of them just for servers and one is just for desktops, or or both, or anyways, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a question that's frequently asked. Uh, asked. So um, Flatpak is primarily designed for uh, desktop applications. Um, Right now, I don't see a reason why you couldn't run server stuff with it. Um, but yeah, um, its main its main use case is uh, is really a desktop application, and that's what that's what the developers are working for on it. While uh, Snappy is was also designed for web uh, applications and for server stuff, so uh, Snappy is a bit more broad in scope. Same goes for Limba. While App Image Kit was also just designed for shipping desktop applications. Which doesn't mean it could also run uh, on server stuff. So, um, the Ubuntu touch apps, which are kind of well that graphical rather than desktop on the touch interfaces, they're meant to migrate to Snappy technology, but it's not done yet. So, but there are public projects and public what is it roadmaps to have that enabled. I'm not sure how much desktop P integration that provides. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah, they, they recently published something to make integration work better with GTK and Qt on their, on their stack. I haven't looked into the details yet and what exactly this thing does, because this is a very tricky issue and it would be awesome if Snappy solved it somehow. Hi, changing subjects, and actually we talked about this in the pub, so perhaps it's more interesting for the rest of the people in the room. Um, there's definitely scope, I th think, for distros to sort of take a more active role in all of this stuff. So, for example, there's a danger that if, uh, if every single upstream, or like a lot of upstreams, especially the interesting upstreams for like our just default um, desktops, like if you know GNOME's getting on board with this stuff, maybe XFCE in future and all of the other ones, KDE and stuff, um, if they start to ship all of their apps in this way, and in fact, if the upstream start to prefer that the users get the apps in this way, then it's um, consequences of that for the people that work on that stuff in the distributions is kind of interesting, right? Because um, right now we are really the sort of most important and really the preferred way that people get the software because there's, these bundling things aren't mature enough yet and there, to date hasn't been a good enough way for people to get the stuff, right? But um, if that starts to become the de facto way, then it's sort of interesting because the role of the distribution packages of end user stuff becomes a bit more, a bit diminished. So I'm wondering, like, if we're happy for that to just go away, or like maybe there's an interesting way that distros can be involved in this stuff, like yeah. um, because if there's a proliferation of in flat pack terms, if there's a proliferation of bundles, like if, if every distro makes its own bundle and then makes its apps available on, on its, uh, sorry, runtime, on its own runtime, then uh, it's, not, it's not exactly a great situation for there to be like n runtimes times the number of distros and then upstreams runtimes and then like it becomes a confusing story for users. So I'm wondering what, what all of this means for people who work in distros on end-user applications if upstream start to think that this is the best way for distributing their stuff. What, do you have any like 
initial thoughts there or not? Uh, well, not much to change after our pub discussion, actually. <laughs> so uh, I yeah, think... Well, maybe anyone else in the room wants to come in. I think the, um, the distributors need to take an active role uh, because, yeah, this is the only way we can shape this future because uh, I think that uh, upstream projects, especially KDE and GNOME, will uh, make this way of distributing stuff uh, a default or at least a, one of the preferred ways to, for users to get new stuff. And therefore, we need to see what we can do as a, as a distribution to make the best out of it. But yeah, it puts the, the people maintaining application packages inside Debian into an awkward situation. Uh, unless, of course, we are thinking about big enterprise environments where they yeah, value the additional security support this gives and the, the very tight integration with the main system. But yeah, for the average user, I think that pack might be the default. We have a few comments from REC. Um, Ashish says that the Standstorm is maybe another bundling system and that SPK packages are anyway when combined with default packaging tooling. So he was, that was a while ago, he was commenting on the fact that Sandstorm is also a bundling system. And um, another comment by M4R, uh, it's quite long, sees that um, I see large security issues with the app bundle concept. I'm rather sure that the most, uh, that, that most upstream in practice won't simply be able to take care of security issues and dependencies, um, maybe due to time or knowledge restraints. If the dependency bundles are provided externally, GNOME or KDE, uh, there's still the question of how long will it take, uh, will uh, be taken care of security-wise. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the selling points of app bundles is that they can rely on bleeding edge stuff at the time of the release, but this bleeding edge stuff uh, often doesn't have a stable API. So who is going to actually take care of keeping order of the older uh, API version of the dependency security uh, supported? Yeah, that's actually the reason why it sucks uh, and why the talk is named that way. Because uh, especially with the Flatpak concept, we might end up with uh, yeah, one Flatpak runtime per GNOME release, so two a year. And uh, yeah, I don't think GNOME will maintain them all for a long time. So we might end up with some applications. Huh? Sandboxing. Sa uh, yeah, sandboxing. I had a discussion with some people and they said basically sandboxing will fix it and there will be no security issues because we sandbox the stuff, which is a, a bold statement, but yeah, it's a problem. That's why Limba was designed that way and yeah, I think yeah, it, might not be, it might not work to have to defer all that updating stuff to upstreams. So there needs to be a compromise in some way, which Flatpak took by uh, splitting out the runtime and making at least some stuff uh, maintained by others who know about how to do it properly. And yeah, have, have um, applications bundle the rest. But yeah, I really can't say anything to make that user feel better, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, how do you think Limba in particular differs from a standard Debian with lots of different library versions packaged? Um, and is that maybe like some sort of compromise that we could do, like providing better tooling around managing multiple versions of library and making it easier to have the right version available? Uh, one thing Limba does is that it also has a certain level of sandboxing involved and that it doesn't uh, run scripts at, at install time. So it doesn't have all these security issues that, uh, that traditional debt packages would have. So this is one thing. And the other thing is that the, uh, the DPKG packaging system isn't really designed for, for doing that, what you propose. There's something called, uh, there's a distribution called NixOS, which, uh, which does that, which uh, basically uh, allows many different versions of different packages to be installed at the same time. Uh, I think morphing Debian into something like that, this is an interesting idea, but yeah, I don't, I don't think that it will work or get enough support by Debian developers. Okay, any more questions? If not, thank you very much. Let's thank speaker. <laughs>